Good evening. Stay in view of the camera, please. Oh, okay, so sorry. So, <laughs> Thank um, you. So this is Getting Real 3. It's a public video conference series. Hip-hop pedagogy, performance, and culture in the classroom and beyond. Um, just some quick housekeeping uh, notices. Uh, turn off your cell phones, please. Put them on vibrate. Um, if you speak, this microphone will pick you up. And so if you can, remain silent for the presentation and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. Um, and, yes. and so we are here for night, what day, what lecture? Number nine? Uh, Eleven. Eleven? Oh my goodness. Well, all right, we missed two because of uh, Sandy. But um, tonight we have a very special guest speaker who is just fantastic. He's your very own professor here at TC. He will be. Uh, who is the baby? Mine. <laughs> 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 of course, Dr. Morell's son. Um, he, uh, Dr. Morell, Ernest Morell is presenting on Hip Hop and English Education, Production, Poetics, Pedagogy, and Praxis. Dr. Morell is the Director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education and Professor of English Education at Teachers College. He is also the Vice President of the National Council of Teachers of English and will assume the presidency of this 50,000 member organization in 2013. For nearly 20 years, Dr. Morell's research has focused on drawing upon youth's interest in popular culture and participatory media technologies to increase motivation and to promote academic literacy development, civic engagement, and college access. He is also recognized nationally for developing powerful models of teaching and learning in classrooms and non-school environments, and for engaging youth and communities in project in the project of educational reform. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ernest Silva. Well, thank you, Wisconsin. Hello, Wisconsin. <laughs> okay, all right. Hey, Chile. <laughs> so, can, uh, you can see me good here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, beautiful. All right. So, um, welcome to, uh, to everyone who's here in New York City. We have a full room. And for those of you who um, have not seen the series before, the way it normally works is someone comes to a warm up the crowd and does a poem um, or some kind of creative expression, and then the speaker comes. Um, but today, uh, I'm doing both of those. Yes. Right? Uh, so I'm going to warm us up with a, a, a poem that I think you will recognize after I begin it. Hopefully, I can get through at least most of it. Um, and then I will switch character and come back to the talk. Um, but this poem uh, says a lot to me about the power of, of hip-hop um, in young people's lives. Um, this was a poem that was very powerful for me in my life when I was a, a youth. So uh, the first time I encountered uh, this poem, I was 15 years old. And so you can imagine uh, a 15-year-old uh, encountering the text that I'm about to read uh, in his room, you know, listening to it on a, on a cassette tape. And at the end of the song, three minutes later, four minutes later, feeling, you know, a little bit taller, a little bit prouder, you know, a little bit smarter, and a little bit louder, right? And there was nothing in my uh, creative literary life that impacted me the way that hip-hop did when I was 15 years old. And I argue, still doing that 30 years later for folks. All right, so here's the poem. You've got to give me some love to get through this, because uh, this, is, this is a stretch for me, but I wanted to read this. Yes. The rhythm, the rebel. Without a pause, I'm lowering my level. The hard rhymer, where you never been, I'm in. You want styling? You know it's time again. Deed, the enemy, telling you to hear it. They praise the music, it's time to play the lyrics. Some say no to the album, the show. Bum rush the sound, I made a year ago. I guess you know, you guess I'm just a radical, not a sabbatical, yes to make it critical. The only part of your body you should be pardoned to, Panther Power on the hour from the rebel to you. Woo! Yeah. Radio suckers never play me on the mix. They just okay me. Not knowing and grown when they're clocking my zone. It's known, snaking, and taking everything that a brother owns. Hard. 
McCollum card. Recorded and ordered. Supporter of Chesimard. Loud and proud. Kicking live. The next poet supreme. Loop of truth. Bazooka. The scheme. Flavor. A rebel in his own mind. Supporter of my rhyme. Designed to scatter a line of suckers who claim I do crime. Terminator X. <laughs> From a rebel. It's final. On black vinyl. Soul rock and roll. Coming like a rhino. Tables turn. Suckers burn to learn. They can't disable the power of my label. Death Jam tells you who I am. The enemy's public. They really give a damn. Strong island where I'm from. I get wild and that's the reason they're claiming that I'm violent. Never silent. No dope getting dumb. Nope. Claiming where we get our remnant from. Number one. We hit you and we give you some. No gun and still never on the run. You want to be an S1? Griff will tell you when. And then you'll come. You know what time it is. Impeach the president. Pulling out a ray gun. Zap the next one. I can be your showgun. Suckers don't last a minute. Soft and smooth. I ain't with it. Hardcore. Raw bone like a razor. I'm like a laser. I just won't graze you. Old enough to raise you. So this will phase you. Get it right, boy, and maybe I will praise you. Playing the role I got sold to. Voice my opinion with volume. Smooth. Know what I am. Rough. Because I'm the man. No matter what the name, we're all the same. Pieces and one big chess game. Yeah, the voice of power in the house. Go take a shower, boy. P.E. a group, a crew, not singular. We're brack wranglers, we're rap stranglers. You can't angle us. I know you're listening. I caught you pissing in your pants. You're scared of dissing us. The crowd is missing us. We're on a mission, boy. Terminator X. Attitude, when I'm on fire, juice on the loose, electric wire, simple and plain, give me the lane, I'll throw it down your throat like Barkley, see the car keys, you'll never get these, they belong to the 9-8 posse, you want some more son, you want to get some, rush the door on the store, pick up the album, you know the rhythm, the rhyme, plus the beat is designed so I can enter your mind, boys, bring the noise, my time, step aside for the Flex Terminator X. Yeah. Right. So that seemed to me like literature, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> literature that spoke to a 15-year-old boy who felt that same sense of anger, um, that, that same sense of kind of rage and love mixed together. And, and that was when I began um, my love affair, not only with hip-hop um, as a cultural form, but hip-hop as a literary form. And that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. You know, we've had um, a number of talks um, that, that talk about the importance of hip-hop and from multiple perspectives. And what I thought um, my contribution could be um, to this series was talking about how hip-hop education might influence literacy education. And you can argue that um, English language arts or literacy education is the backbone of all the other disciplines because you can't engage the other disciplines without having that literacy. Right? So I'd like to take, um, you know, this, my 45 minutes or so, to kind of talk about um, how we might begin to visualize what this might look like. I'll begin by situating the need for hip-hop in schools in a large educational context, then I'll explain it in the literacy context, and the four components I'd like to talk about that might anchor what this might look like in English would be the production, the poetics, the pedagogy, and the practice. Right, so... I'm going to start with, uh, with another poem. Um, this one is from one of my uh, students that I worked with in California uh, who participated in, in a part of a curriculum that was centered around hip hop. And this is how he talked about the role that being a poet, um, being a, a, a hip hop poet, played in, in changing his life. Uh, living in a very unsafe neighborhood, going through life, critically misunderstood, got robbed at the age seven, stole my first bike at the age 11, lived in El Sereno, but raised in Hazard, living in the ghetto was pretty much mastered. Still, I live my life freely. All I want to do is be me. My uncle went to jail as a teen. He did the stupidest things I've ever seen. I was so close to following his every step and could have had so much street rep. But I'm leading my life toward a different story. I'll make sure people will see me achieve glory. I'll be here forever. You know, I'm in my fall shot. And I ain't waiting for closure. I will never forfeit it. forget it. Did you get the picture yet? I'm painting you a portrait of a youngster. Right? And he goes on um, in that poem, and, and when, he, when he shared that poem, to talk about how uh, in engaging other people's poetry, particularly through hip hop, gave him a critical lens with which to analyze his own life. And, and he began to produce knowledge and share that with others, right? And this is some of the untapped potential, right? These stories that our, our young people are dying to tell each other about themselves to each other, that, that we can make space for it, something like a hip hop education. So the educational context. This look familiar? Mm -hmm. Right? Heads down, look at a desk. Not every classroom in America looks like this, but many of them do. Right? And so you have to ask yourself, what, what kind of purpose does this education serve? Well, 
This education serves the purpose of preparing people for uh, manual labor in an industrialized society. Right? The ill logic of, of American schooling is that it encourages voicelessness because at the turn of the century when we, when we created schools, that's what they needed. People who could read the manual and keep their heads down and be quiet. Right? You ask kindergartners, six months in the school, what does it mean to be a good student? Keep your head down, right? don't talk. Just like this. Right? And this is the context. And we need to understand that it, the school, it's school that's illogical, right? Dropping out of school, being disengaged from school might be destructive, but it's not illogical, right? We have to understand the logic of educational disinvestment in our young people, right? They may be making decisions that harm their lives, and I would argue in many cases they do, but there's a logic to it. The logic is that the schooling itself is illogical, right? It doesn't give them what they need. It doesn't respect them as having voice. It doesn't uh, honor or even promote the kinds of literacies that exist in 2012, let alone 2050 or 2100 when you know, these kids are going to be in their prime. So we have to address that. And we have to begin there when we think about um, what's wrong with education. Right? It's not our kids. Right? They are as bright, as beautiful, as smart, as brilliant as they've ever been. But school is outmoded, outdated, um, and, and abusive. Right? And, and it's silencing of young people. The American high school, I argue, is one of the most toxic institutions on the planet. Amen. Yeah. American high school, right? 99 plus percent of kids who start kindergarten make it to high school in America. But for many of our communities, less than half make it out. Oftentimes, less than one in 10 of those who started make it out of high school with the courses and the ability to, to um, produce post-secondary education. One institution, one like four-year snapshot. Our 14-year-olds show up to high school, half of them gone by the time they're 18. Right? You can see some of these images, right? Where the high school is like a prison, right? Where it, this kid isn't even in high school being fingerprinted. So we need, we need to think about that. Um, what can we do in this space to make it different, to make it more humane, to connect with kids? Obviously, why would you go through nine years of schooling if you didn't plan on going to 13? What happens that destroys those dreams? Right? I argue that this is a K-16 um, perspective on hip-hop education, but I really focus on those four years. Maybe you include eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade. Um, as, as the core time where we either inspire lifelong learning or we um, kick people out of school, right, and, and doom them to a life where they have to try to survive without having an education. These are some of the uh, statistics that I just said, uh, but uh, I want to uh, point you to this third bullet point about the cost of dropouts. There's a way to talk about this in economic terms. There's also a way to talk about it in humanistic terms. Economic terms, according to uh, Henry Levin, who's a, a colleague here at Teachers College, um, Reducing the dropout rate by half would, in effect, bring a trillion dollars to the American economy over the course of a decade, approximately $127,000 per student. Most of that would be concentrated in our central cities. If you look at it in the humanistic terms, the cost of dropouts is that smile, that young girl. Right? We think of this problem in too distant a term. Right? You think about it as dropouts. I think of it as lost dreams. Because that's what my students talk about. Every kid comes to school with a dream, right? And, 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 and losing dreams, or losing some grandma's grandbaby, right? Some mother and father's only child, someone's younger brother, maybe your younger brother, your younger sister, right? We have to personalize this. The cost of dropouts is the, is the human potential that is lost. And half of our youth of color, more maybe, right? Not having that opportunity. That's a national crisis, and I argue that education is a civil rights issue of our time. I'm here to talk about hip-hop, but hip-hop to me is the means, not the end. The end is radically transforming education for our young people. Right? That's what it's about. That's why I'm here. That's why I do this work, because I think it's important. Now, there are other possibilities for school, and that's the thing. We have to look at crisis in the presence of possibility. Right? This principal, who some of you recognize, is happy because he's raising his graduation rate. Right? Um, there are possibilities. Every week, I go into a school that is succeeding, where kids feel good about themselves, feel good about being there, are doing well. You can drive two miles and you can see a school that's fair on the same population. The variable is not the kids. It is the institution. Right? We cannot look at this crisis as immutable, unchangeable. 
right? We can change it, right? What do we have to do in order to ensure that kind of possibility? Simple question. Right? I think we ask questions that are too complicated. I want to think about very simple questions that I think make the difference between schools that succeed and schools that do not. Number one, how do we get kids excited about learning? Quit worrying about the achievement gap. Worry about getting kids excited about learning and you will not have an achievement gap. Schools where kids are excited about learning don't have the dropout issues, don't have the achievement issues, don't have the classroom management issues. Ask the simple question. Ask the positive question. Get kids turned on. Get them excited about learning. Question two, how do we get kids to believe in themselves as intellectuals, as readers, and as writers? Right? I argue more than having um, an ability crisis or an achievement crisis, we have an identity crisis. We know from countless surveys um, that the aspirations for youth are generally high across race, across gender, across um, class, across geography. All kids want to succeed. The difference between those who do succeed and those who do not is not because of aspirations. Largely, it's because of perception. That's the issue that we have to. What is it that's happening to these kids? Do you know the five-year-old? You know, if you want to see an emotional scene, you know, look at the first day of school in kindergarten. Like, who is coming into that elementary school expecting to be a failure in education? They all want to succeed, right? They want to please their teachers. They want to do well. But over time, schooling tells many of them, this is not a place where you're going to do well, right? This is not a place where you're going to have success. And so we have kids. You don't have to convince them that schooling is a good thing. You have to convince them that they're, they're good enough to do school and that, they're, that they're, they have an academic intelligence and they have a brilliance about them, right? That's the issue. You don't have to tell a kid, you know, Doing well in school is going to help you in your future. What we have to tell them through our actions is that I believe in you. Right? If we, we need to believe in them for them to believe in themselves. Again, don't make it rocket science. Schools that get kids to believe in themselves do better than schools that do not. The third question. We need to ask ourselves, what kind of education will these children need? Not what kind of education are we trained or equipped to provide? Because right now we're reducing education to our training instead of being innovative and innovating education to the students needs. Right? My one year old son, who's in the back, you know, yelling daddy, <laughs> if if he's if he's healthy, he'll live to see the twenty second century. Twenty second century. Right? His year of graduating high school is twenty thirty. Right? He'll leave the workforce about twenty seventy five. Why are we teaching him like it's eighteen seventy five? Right? Why are we teaching these kindergartners in the same way that we taught 100 years ago? Understanding that they're inhabiting a very different kind of world. A world where they need to be more interactive, more digital. Where they need to be producers of knowledge and not just regurgitating. Where being silent is not going to get you a job. It's actually going to prevent you from getting a job. Right? You need different kinds of literacies. Multimodal literacies, digital literacies, critical literacies. We need to be you know, diverse in our spectrum of how students have the ability to communicate with each other. Right? That's the kind of education they need. <coughs> The, the barrier is us and our training, right? And, and, and not being able to get outside of that 20th century mode of, you know, this is what it means to do schooling. But we have to break out of that in English. And I'm challenging my discipline to do it, um, and, and, and I'm challenging all of you to do the same. We need to understand that um, if we can impact literacy, you can change the culture of a school, right? Changing literacy. Doing something positive changes the culture of a school. Zero tolerance doesn't work because you're not dealing with the symptoms of the problem, right? You're dealing with it after the fact. Um, students feel better about themselves when they're achieving and when their literacies and languages are valued and they see themselves as doing well in school. They feel better about the school, right? They want to take care of it. They want to, they want to cultivate that culture. They feel better about each other. Right? I'm, I'm much happier to be here. I would be pretty put out too if I was 10 years old and all I got told every day in school is that I was a failure. Right? I might erupt and push somebody who bumped into me too because I'm feeling pretty angry. But students who feel good about themselves academically and who feel cared about in the school really see the school culture as precious. Right? So we need to connect the hip hop education to the literacy education. And we can connect the literacy education to changing school climate, right? This can have uh, all sorts of larger implications, much bigger than just helping raise test scores. So we know that uh, school climate impacts achievement. It improves academic identities. Students feel like we are smart here, not I am a good student, 
right? Um, one of the schools where I work, uh, you know, it has a, a, you know, on the door says, we all sweat. Right? It's a we. It's kind of a collective energy. Right? Everyone at this school is here to achieve. Uh, it increases um, communication and collaboration. Right? It, 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 it increases connections between a local and a global context. So those are the kind of things that we want to have. And I think we need to think differently about the inputs. Um, finally, uh, before I jump into um, a few uh, theoretical considerations that will frame um, this, this view of hip-hop in English education, we need to cultivate youth voices. Right? That, that should be our primary goal at school, is giving a kid a voice and giving her you know, a sense of self and identity. I can't predict that future, but I want to help the young girl who's going to be able to invent that future, right? to have the confidence of her voice, an academic voice, a community voice, right? diverse voices, voice in print, voice multimodally, voice through genres like hip hop, digital filmmaking, right? because we know that youth are motivated to have something to say. What we can help them do is figure out the multiple ways to say that. Help them feel good about their ability to say that. Help them say it with authority and power. And help them to use their voice instead of violence. And most importantly, to help them use their voice to work together for change. Right? That's how we can change the educational context through an empowered model of literacy education. Um, and finally, this is the last one. Uh, one of the biggest issues why kids are dropping out is because of lack of attachment. Right, and I argue that, that hip-hop in English education can help us to increase attachments. There are several kinds of attachments that are very important for young people to make. We know in life, if you don't have a primary caregiver who you're attached to, it's much harder to develop um, socially. It's the same in school. Right? If you're not attached to the academic world, if you don't see yourself as being able to do academic work mm -hmm. and liking it, it is hard for you to be attached to school and to develop the literacies you need in school. Two, if you're not attached to the others in your classroom, right, heads down, you know, you're in the back doing, you know, busy work because the teacher thinks you read below grade level, that's not going to get you attached to others in your classroom, right? Learning how to communicate, working together as groups, working on projects, figuring out what can we do in the second grade to help change our community, change people's values, right? That's going to get you attached to others in your classroom. Then that student is gone for two days and they come back and everyone says, we missed you, right? It wasn't the same without you here. We know that makes a difference. High school dropout research. High schoolers can point to you know, more than two people on the campus who care about them, they're much less likely to drop out. Again, not rocket science. Um, attachment to their community and the larger social world. Not seeing, having to make a choice between being attached to the community and being attached to school. Right? Those identities aren't antithetical to one another, they inform their dialectical. The more I do in school, the more that gives me power to do things in my community. The more I do things in my community, the more it reinforces why I need to do school. Right? Schooling can do that, can bring those two together, can form those kinds of attachments. All right, uh, a couple of things about the, the, the theory that, that kind of frames this work. The first is, uh, what motivates kids, right? Remember that question, what gets them excited about learning? What motivates kids? Well, we know what doesn't motivate them. I mean, this theory that I came across in my second and third year teaching changed my teaching life and what I did. And it's, it's, it's a long name, the Expectancy Value Theory of Achievement Motivation, but it basically says um, there are two factors that determine how motivated you're going to be. The first one is um, confidence, right, or the expectation of success. The more that I am confident that I can actually perform a task, the more motivated I'll be. But the opposite of that is true. If I do not expect success, I will not be motivated. You can yell at me, you can threaten me, you can call my mama, you can make me put my head on the desk, stand in the corner, wear a dunce cap, whatever. I'm not going to be motivated if I do not believe I can succeed. So if you want to raise motivation, you have to raise confidence. You have to, every kid has to expect success. The second is relevancy or the value proposition. Think of all of the complicated cognitive activities that kids master on a daily basis. Right? Like those that are able to tweet with their hand under the desk and pretend like they don't have a cell phone. Right? Yeah, you can bring your phones out. I, I encourage the tweeting. Uh, uh, but, but, but we know this, right? And it's not a question of intelligence. When they're motivated because something has a high value to them, they want to get it done. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was asking kids to do things they didn't expect to success in and they didn't see as relevant. No wonder I was talking to heads on the desk. And I learned that very early in my career. As an educator, you have to talk the heads off the desk. Right, that is your job. Right, you talk those heads off the desk. You can do it, and it's important to do it. Right? That, that's where that you know, achievement motivation theory comes from. 
The second is uh, this education for critical consciousness, the work of Paulo Freire, many of you have read. Uh, he says, true education must begin with the experiences of the people. Right? I start with third graders, fourth graders, and I say, how many of you would like to change the world? Right? And the hands go up and say, you've got to be smart to change the world. Right? You've got to know math to change the world. You've got to be a reader if you want to change. They all want to change the world. And you connect it to something there. Right? So what do you want to change? Well, I'm tired of everyone in my family throwing away recyclable goods. Like, well, let's create a newsletter. Right? Second, third graders in Virginia, we're going to create a newsletter. We're going to do research. We're going to, you know, we need to know chemistry. We need to understand how the environment works. Or um, kids in the Bay Area talking about food deserts, right? And researching where you can get fresh fruit in the neighborhood. It matters to them. It's connected to their experiences. They have a cross-curricular, you know, uh, approach that's looking at science, looking at math, looking at social studies, looking at English, and they're trying to educate folks about how can we get healthier food in our neighborhood. It's not that they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn what we're teaching them. Who would? If it's irrelevant, right? So, and it has to be done in a way that is participatory, that is problem posing, that isn't banking, right? So what matters to you, but let's work on it together, right? And in the course of learning, you will produce something, right? You will become something. We know that's how people learn in every other organization but school. People learn through doing things. Schooling is the only institution where learning happens differently than learning how to tie your shoe or ride a bike or throw a football or <coughs> dessert or whatever it is. You learn by watching someone doing it and you do it yourself. Right? So again, not rocket science, but uh, important to consider the work of, uh, of Paul Ferry. And finally, Wisconsin folks, right? It's Gloria in the room. I can't even hear. This is someone you probably recognize. Uh, Gloria Lads and Billings in culturally relevant teaching. Right, that her conception of culturally relevant teaching is much more complex than what most people make it out to be. Three pillars of the work, and I, I encountered Gloria's words before I encountered the person, um, and they're both wonderful. But, but this three-part approach that Gloria advocates really, really impacted my teaching. One, students must experience academic success. Right? It's not culturally relevant if they're not experiencing success. Uh, they must develop and or maintain cultural competence. Competence in, in the languages of nurture, in, 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 their, in their community values. And they must develop a critical consciousness. Academic success, cultural competence, and critical consciousness. Right? If we put all those things together, you can begin to see how hip-hop and hip-hop education may be able to transform what we do in English language arts, the humanities. Uh, Dr. Chris Emden is going to talk in a couple weeks about what this can do in the math and sciences. All right, so I'm going to run through this deliberate. Uh, context, we know that um, kids are literate in multiple ways and they express multiple competencies, many of which are disregarded by school, but could be tapped into to develop their literacies in school. But school literacies should also be adapting to the literacies that are indigenous to our youth because those are the literacies of the future. Right? You can't squash those out. It's, the world is changing. So framework for literacy education. Um, thinking of four ways of constructing literacy. Right? And I won't talk about them, I'll just read them. Literacies are multiple. Right, this is a plural term, you guys, not a singular term. Literacies, they are multiple. They're social, right? They're only valuable when they're enacted with each other. We become literate so that we can communicate with each other, right? So what are the social spaces where, where literacies are developed and enhanced? And it would be uh, important for us to understand those spaces if we're thinking about how to help people become literate. Literacies are cultural. Literacy practices are tied to cultural practice. Some cultural practices are reified, some are denigrated, and so the literacies have a hierarchy mostly because of political concerns, not because of anything empirical. Right? Um, there's no difference in the intellect it takes to speak black English and standard English. One is just sanctioned and the other is not. So we have to understand that. Literacies are cultural practices, and, and we want students to be multicultural in their literate behavior, which means we have to cultivate academic literacies, of course, but at the same time, as Gloria encourages, cultivating those other cultural literacies at the same time in our classrooms. And finally, literacies is critical. Right? It's not about preparing women to sit at a sewing machine with their head down anymore. It means being able to deconstruct power relations, to speak back to text, to produce your own text, right? to ask hard questions, to not accept everything you read, to get inside of it, to say, what are the rhetorical, um, you know, what, what rhetorical strategies is this person trying to use to manipulate me? Because if it's published, there probably are some rhetorical strategies intended to manipulate you. Uh, but then you also think about what rhetorical strategies are effective with communicating with others, right? And, and that's important too. So critical literacy isn't just about critiquing things. It's about understanding the power of language. 
right? and when you communicate, in what ways, and what frame. So our young people have a much better sense of how to communicate with others their age, right? So why take those literacies away at the point is to help them be powerful and communicate with their peers, right? All right. So what does this look like? So we all, excuse me, Ernie, yeah. Ernie, we lost the we've lost the PowerPoint. Okay. Did someone do anything over there by chance? No, there we go. We got it back. Okay, it looks the same here. Right? Okay, we're good. All right. Yeah. So, so what? Thank you. Uh -huh. What does this look like in a vision for hip hop and the future of English education? The first thing we have to understand, um, and uh, Martha introduced me, said I was vice president. I'm now the president of elective NCTE, and I'm chairing the convention in Boston. And this is the theme for the conference, reinventing the future of English. And it, it, it comes from a quote that really inspired my life, and it says, uh, futures cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. Right? And we want to be inventors of the future in our discipline. And I have the re in there because this isn't the first time that we've invented a future. Right? This is just the next time. It's our generation's turn. How do we reinvent this discipline to hold true to its values, but to reflect the changing times and the changing populations? Right? That's what it's about. So a couple of ways. The first one, hip-hop is cultural production. Right? One way to think about how hip-hop can be brought in the English classroom is to think about the history of hip-hop as cultural production through many forms. So uh, here's a quiz. You know, People can call out the Wisconsin folks can too. So uh, the one on um, the right is... The right, this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Grandmaster Flash. Come on. And left, on the left? Chuck D. Chuck D. All right. Um, that's not the, the point, but the, uh, <laughs> hip hop is cultural production. Hip hop has been um, a, a production of culture. Let's, let's look at some of the ways, right? So the art form, right? The MC, the rapping, the lyrics, right? It, it, it's produced a culture, a language, right? Uh, a stance toward the world. You think about the collection of the lyrics. Um, Rebel Without a Pause that I just read, you know, where Chuck D is talking about, you know, uh, how he feels powerful, empowered, and knowledgeable, and is sharing his, his understanding of, of, of what, what some of the uh, constraints that his community has been under, but, but some of the ways out, right? So we've, we've gotten that from uh, hip hop as cultural production, a counterculture that speaks to young people about a sense of agency. Um, we also have, and uh, I won't play the guess who's game because you can't see his face, <laughs> but, uh, but DJ. Right, and this art of entertaining and a party, uh, and I can remember, you know, being part of the hip hop culture and going to parties and people just kind of, you know, uh, sitting around and, uh, you know, the the no music. Like, this isn't a party. Right? Hip hop kind of changed what it meant. You have to have turntables and you got to have people spinning on their heads for it to be a party now, right? So it, it changed the culture of engagement, right? And 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 um, illuminated the imaginations of a generation, and I'd argue now we're the third generation of young people. B-boy and B-girl, right? Hip-hop is dance. You can't watch a Super Bowl ad without seeing people using hip-hop dance, right, and, uh, to sell Cheetos, McDonald's cheeseburgers, or you know, Samsung Galaxy tap phones, or whatever it is. But, uh, but, but hip-hop has produced a culture around movement, around dance, right? It's changed, and you watch the Los Angeles Lakers cheerleaders, and they're not getting out there in Walton, are they? <laughs> no, right? That dance came from hip-hop, right? And this, this is what it means to move. We don't even have our young people understand the culture. I mean, we're in New York City, right? You can't throw a rock without hitting hip hop culture. Right? How come that isn't the center of what we're doing in English class? Right? The kids understand all these things. Uh, the graffiti, right? The art, look at that. Uh, the visual art, uh, the talent in that, in that artwork. How many more kids would be inspired to do art if they were able to do these sorts of things? So uh, I want to expand what we think about. We think about hip hop education in English class. I'll get to the, you know, looking at hip hop as poetry, but I think hip hop is a, is a form of cultural production. Imagine the kind of uh, interactive multimodal research projects kids could do about hip hop production in the community, right? Whether they're looking in Wisconsin, uh, whether they're looking out here in New York City, or, or globally, in a global context. Look at what's happening in the continent of Africa, or Latin America, the Caribbean. Uh, the Czech Republic, right? You know, it's, it's a global phenomenon now. And, and think about how much more excited kid might be to actually do research on something like that. Uh, fashion, right? We produce the whole culture around fashion, um, what it means to be hip, right? So, so the, this is a, a very, you know, robust area of study and understanding how hip hop produces culture. 
right, and how mainstream American culture has been impacted by the production of culture through hip hop. Because I argue that young people need to see themselves as producers of culture, not just consumers of culture. Now, maybe a lot of that has been co-opted for profit. There's no maybe right there. It has been co-opted for profit. But it doesn't change the power of them as producing culture. Forty years ago, just on the streets and in the South Bronx or Queens, and now, you know, a global phenomenon to sell cheeseburgers. That's a huge shift. And understanding how it's continuing to shift and grow is important. Uh, print media and digital media. Right? You think about magazines like Source or Vibe or Rap Pages or, you know, going way back to Yo! MTV Raps or uh, that, that hip-hop has, has impacted media, right? Media production as well. Now, we have a project, you know, that uh, we're getting started here where, where young people are doing the history in Harlem research, right? And so you think about the connections to the humanities. Uh, why not look at the history of musical production in Harlem? Why not connect um, understanding the history of, of, of the music production to the history of cultural production through hip-hop, right? Or other forms of, of music that came before hip-hop, right? This is a, a, something that I think is, could really um, enrich what we do in humanities classes, right? We, we start with Mesopotamia. Who cares about Mesopotamia? I don't even know how people got to my block, <laughs> right? Let's start with what happened on your block and go back to Mesopotamia. Right? And you would see the roots of hip-hop in you know, some of those cultures that are 2,000 years old, 3,000 years old in the west coast of Africa. Be much more interested in the west coast of Africa if you understood and were, and were able to be proud of the cultural production on your own block, your own hood, your own you know, geography. Right? So we, we need to turn that on its head. And I argue that looking at hip-hop as a form of cultural production would allow us to do that. The political economy of hip-hop. This man, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. I love that quote. Right? <laughs> Get it, right? It's cold. Uh, studying the political economy of hip hop, both in terms of um, how hip hop is used for com commercial purposes, um, you know, to deconstruct that and the co optation of culture, but also to look at uh, most of the wealthy individuals that are African American have come through the media. Right? and have used the media as a route to empowerment. And so it's, it's not just to be critical of that, but to look at hip-hop as a political economy. Right? Um, Multi-billion dollars, right, Martha? I mean, Multi-billion dollar economy, largely produced by people of color. Right? A business, man. Right? And I know a kid or two that would be excited about that. Right? To begin to think about exploring the political economy of hip-hop. Now, um, to what you would expect, right? The poetics of hip hop. Looking at hip hop as a poetic form, and you know, how I read Chuck D, uh, you know, uh, that the, the, the language, the lyrics of it, the poetry of it. Right? You can do everything that you want to do with canonical poetry, with hip hop poetry, with a lot more energy and excitement from the kids. Hip hop and anti colonial consciousness. I won't read all of this, but uh, you know, the school recipes. Now is a chance to advance and get an outlook, create the circumstance, because I doubt books can relay words this way, so I'll portray a new image. And let's begin as members who pledge to look up ahead to a beautiful world, though we've been told to believe it will not be, and still we are seeing green, there will be peace, the wealth will increase, will prosper, you know, like flourishing, the rhyme I toss at you, be nourishing, because I must bring ideas for a better living, because I do believe in positivity. Cool. Right? That hip-hop can help young people to develop an anti-colonial consciousness or to affirm their anti-colonial consciousness. There are multiple ways of being, right? Understanding how you may be at odds with a majoritarian view, but that doesn't mean that your views don't matter. Right? We talk about post-colonialism, which I don't understand so much, but anti-colonialism, I understand, is a discourse that hey, slaves were mad, but post-colonial Post-colonialism did not start in 1980. Like, slaves were mad about it in 1600, believe me, right? And Native Americans were mad about it in 1492, believe me. Anti-colonial consciousness has existed in a parallel and counter-narrative trajectory to a colonial consciousness. As long as there's colonizing, believe me, there's anti-colonizing by the folks being colonized. But what does it mean to evoke and to affirm that consciousness? Right? There are many ways that you can think about doing that. Um, through analyzing the lyrics of hip-hop. <coughs> hip-hop is critical race studies, right? Connecting, you know, this idea of the centrality of racism to study hip-hop. Lauren Hill, the subconscious psychology that you use against me if I lose control will send me to the penitentiary, such as Alcatraz, or shot up like El Hajj Malik Shabazz. High class gets bypassed while my ass gets harassed. 
and the Fudd Street bros like the man that never was, and if you're too powerful, you get bugged like Peter Tosh and Marley was. And my word does nothing against the Fed, so my eyes stay red as I chase crazy bullheads heads word. Right? Critical race studies. What does it mean to be black in America? What does it mean to be Latino in America? What does it mean to be a woman in America, to be impoverished in America, to be a young person in America? I can't think of a genre more robust with examples of those narratives than hip hop. Right? And students can share their own narratives, right? You know, I was in my 20s, but I used this when I first started teaching. It's just like subconscious psychology that you use against me if I lose control send me to the penitentiary. I had to tell my dissertation committee, I'm putting Lauren Hill on my attitude. <laughs> and I went in my meeting and I said, they said, why? Because she's the most powerful social theorist out there. Like, come on, right? Bored Jew, Mark, Lauren Hill. Write <laughs> <laughs> it down and you can bob your head to it at the same time, right? Because it's real. And, and so you think about, like, how can we give like, some substances I did critical race study? <coughs> Hip hop feminism, right? I mean, you got folks like Arlen Martha Diaz here and thinking about you know, how hip hop can help us understand um, the, the, the confluence of race, class, and gender, right? and age, I argue, right? for, for a different kind of a feminist project um, in two ways. I mean, obviously, um, having a language to deconstruct the misogyny that you see present in hip-hop. But that's just the beginning, right? It's the counterproduction, right? It's, like, it's, it's reproducing notions of womanhood that comport with the, the hip-hop culture, that, that, the lived experience of, the, of, of these young girls and young women, uh, uh, young adult women. What, a, what an opportunity, right? Both to teach all the kinds of literary critical readings that we need to have, but thinking about that production, right? What it means to be me. Uh, and, and many others, right? All the things that we can do with literature, we can do here. Here's something that I think we don't think about as much in terms of English study and hip hop, and that is the language of rhetoric. <coughs> How do authors use language to persuade? What are the rhetorical techniques that make an audience compelled to do something, right? And we know about the logos and the pathos and the ethos and those sorts of things, but looking at the language of hip hop, both in terms of um, reifying and legitimating um, largely an African-American English vernacular discourse, but I think it's more, uh, more multicultural than that these days, um, but also the strategies. Keith Gilliard says, a pedagogy is successful only if it makes knowledge or skill achievable while at the same time allowing students to maintain their own sense of identity. I agree with that. I would also argue that some things are just said more effectively um, in different languages, different vernaculars, and you can't translate, right? What would be the rough translation of the Lauren Hill verse? You know, um, people use strategies to get inside the mindset and you know manipulate you, and the dominant hegemony makes you you know lead you to actions that might. By that time, you can't even dance. You lost the rhythm, right? <laughs> it's much better to just say the subconscious psychology you use against me to lose control will send me to the penitentiary, right? And look at the brilliance of that. Right? Look at the rhetoric of it. Look at the linguistic capital there. Right? Why do we want to eradicate that linguistic capital? Because that capital connected with a generation of young people is continuing to do that. Always has. So we need to think about hip-hop and rhetorical studies. Right? The language of hip-hop and how people use language to persuade. And I put some of the uh, goals here from the, uh, you know, the AP language standards. Students rhetorically analyze author's purpose, intended audience, and goals. Lauren Hill had an audience. She had an intended purpose and a goal. You can look at that in her lyrics, you can look at it in interviews and understand, okay. So, trying to entertain, trying to move hip hop to a different place, or contemporary artists are doing the same thing, right? And, and, and help young people to see part of what we need to do in using um, our, our cultural tools for social movements is to understand how they're rhetorically powerful, right? My kids taught that to me. Adding a soundtrack to a documentary to talk about injustice was much more effective than you know writing a research paper and putting it in a PDF and handing it to 5,000 kids. It's a different rhetoric. Right? You've got to think about your audience, you've got to think about your goals, you've got to think about your purpose. So this is one way we can think about hip-hop studies in English education. The pedagogy of hip-hop. Two ways to think about this. One is, how can a pedagogy of Four young people be inspired by the principles of hip hop, but the others, how do young people use hip hop as they become public <coughs> pedagogues? Right? We think about the pedagogy of hip hop as ha it has to flow two ways. Right? I think that latter is much more powerful. How do we help young people to be on stage 
right? To be powerful pedagogues. You think about, um, you know, uh, what was that, 86 um, edutainment? KRS one around there, right? And mm -hmm. that idea, was that, that's someone had the year. Um, this idea that you can um, educate and entertain, right? Or, or many different um, uh, artists have talked about that role of um, entertaining folks, but also educating. Uh, so so how, how can that happen? How can we help young people? A couple of ways. I know that there's a, um, you know, a, a project part of this is going to be Schomburg, I think, Martha, but others were talking about the collection of hip-hop flyers. Yes. Right? And, and hip-hop is a critical media literacy. Right, and thinking about how these images, and you can see even the images at our institute are largely informed by this aesthetic, right? That what pops out to you, and totally transforming how you make a flyer or a web page, or the, the graphic sensibilities, and hip hop becomes a critical media literacy, a way that you can use multiple modes to um, catch people's eyes. Again, I would argue that there's an entertainment component just to looking at the flyer, <coughs> but an educational component, right? You can't just put words out there, that's boring, no one's gonna look at it. Got to put them sideways, right? Or put somebody with their hat on. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a moment of entertainment and critical engagement at the same time. Right? That's one of the ways hip hop functions as pedagogy. Uh, performance as pedagogy. Right? The slam, or the cipher, or the concert. How come we don't have more of those at school? Right? You know, uh, like a Wednesday assembly, you know, a short day and like a one to three, it's just, you know, everybody's coming in on stage and it's like freestyle or whatever, right? that, that allow people to perform. And right? it's through that performance that we can teach. Uh, and and that, that's such an underutilized component of, of English. Right? Why write it and just hand it to the teacher? You know, blog it make a video, put it on YouTube, you know, uh, the old dramas that you do, and you, uh, you know, what is it, like, uh, acting out to kill a mockingbird yet again? <laughs> <laughs> write a hip-hop play, right? So we wrote this thing, and he, he wrote the soundtrack, and, you know, Fridays and Saturdays from 7.30 to 9.30, and, and kids are dying to be able to do those sorts of things. So we have to think about how performance becomes a part of the pedagogy. Um, the foundations of a hip-hop pedagogy, I won't be able to talk about this much because I want to um, end so there can be questions, uh, but it has to have voice, has to have affirmation, um, has to have purpose and love, promote the hip-hop practitioner's pedagogue, use hip-hop cultural production to raise social awareness, affirm identities, educate about key social issues, celebrate linguistic and ethnic pluralism, and reframe the public discourse around youth, cities, race, poverty, gender, inequity, and eco-apartheid. Comma, 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 you keep filling it in. Right? I just ran out of room, not ideas to talk about what hip hop cultural production can do. You get it. The praxis of hip hop. Right? We need to think about how hip hop has informed social movements, right? And everyone remember Will I Am in 2008, and it wasn't so much about a presidential candidate as much as it was youth speaking through social media about becoming empowered members of the electorate. Right? It was movements like Will I Am that increased the youth electorate, you know, more than anything else that adults were doing. Right, that was a social movement, or uh, the role that in the, you know, the 80s, Public Enemy and other groups played in raising awareness around Nelson Mandela, right? and issues in South African apartheid. And uh, you can go on and on and on, the role of hip hop in the Occupy movement. Right? I mean, there, that, the, the soundtrack to most of our contemporary revolutions is hip hop, if it involves young people. Right? And um, you know, our guests from the Czech Republic, or folks that talked in, in South Africa or other countries, when you get mad about something and you want a revolutionary discourse and you're young, hip hop is gonna come. Right? I mean, that's, that's the way to say, I'm mad about it, right? I wanna do something about it uh, in, a, in a global discourse in, in, in uh, the 21st century. So we need to tap into that, right? And have young people studying that and thinking about how to produce social movements. What if producing a social movement was your final project in English? Right? <laughs> Get to it, right? <laughs> November 19th, you know, I want a draft of your movement by December, and you gotta do it, right? Um, it sounds funny, but it seems like a good project to me. Starting a social movement. So finally, hip hop in the future of English. Could this be the back corner of your English classroom? Right? You think about the grants and the stuff you bring in there, that doesn't cost as much as all those grammar books you have in the classroom, you know, or the curriculum. Write a couple of grants, and I'm going to get some keyboards and some speakers, and you know, we got a studio. Or take that old classroom that nobody uses. Like, you know that classroom no one uses? We're going to make it into a hip hop studio. Right? 
right? See how many poets and authors you have showing up in there trying to book their 15 minute time slot, yeah. you know, throw something down and beat makers, right? You know they would use it, right? Yeah. Why don't we have them at school? Why aren't there recording studios at school? Why, why aren't there record labels at school? Right? Why isn't that happening? Think this could be your final project, designing the coolest flyer? Or putting on a project, you know, for whatever you do and have kids using graphic arts to design flyers in English class, and this be a genre, right? You think about the intelligence and the multimodality in creating these things and the brilliance in them. Cool. Could this be your next school assembly? Instead of saying no to drugs, or you know, we're going to raise our test scores. Like, no, this is our assembly, right? We got dance and we got MCs. What happened to the school assembly? Where kids actually did stuff. Remember those? I mean, some people are as old as me would. You know, we used to have assemblies where kids did stuff, right? And it wasn't just talking about raising test scores or, you know, you can't wear hats or use cell phones. We can bring that back, right? Um, and then finally, what if this was your award-winning hip-hop literary magazine that you had print and digital versions of? And your kids were traveling around the country talking about this magazine that included lyrics and criticism and social action and art, right? Um, and, and an online capacity to print capacity. Right? At NCTE, we have a, a journal competition, a literary competition. There are no entries from New York, but I know all sorts of things are going on in New York. I said, Next year in Boston, yeah, we're going to have some hip-hop literary magazines that folks are going to be bringing stuff. Right? This could be what your English class does. You learn about drafting, learn about writing, the writing process, all those good things. So how does this happen? Right? We have to maintain a critical hope. We have to maintain a belief that this is actually truer to our discipline than what we are doing now. This isn't antithetical to the discipline. This is what English has always been about. Understanding and deconstructing the human condition, having the power and the literate tools to be able to tell your story because we are the sum of the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. That's how we are constructed as people. This is English. It's not antithetical to English. It's not tangential to English. It's not what you do after English. This is English. Right? Hip-hop and English are on the same trajectory. So we have to maintain that hope. We have to be willing, like Martha's doing with the Hip-Hop Education Center, to put ourselves out there, to collect information, to say, we're going to go in classrooms, in classrooms. I love all the outside of school stuff, but it's 8.30 to 2.30 where our babies are being lost. <laughs> right? Come on, you've got to fight that battle 8.30 to 2.30. You can't come in there at 3.30 after that kid's been beat up all day and be like, okay, now let's make some beats. Make the beats in math class. Right? You know, write the rhymes in English class. Study the cultural production in history class. Look at eco-apartheid in science class. We have to collect the information, though. And we have to be willing to share that information, right, to others, to make space. It's through sharing information we make space for others to do it. So finally, you know, I just want to say, folks are doing this. Give a shout out to folks that are coming next couple weeks. Um, Jen Johnson is going to be coming and talking about the hip-hop uh, debate, and the kids are as good as anybody in the country. Uh, Chris Emden is going to be coming and talking about uh, what this looks like in math and science classes. And, and Sam Seidel is going to talk, be talking about what it looks like at the whole high school. He's got a hip-hop high school. Right? We need to know about that. We need to be sharing that. Right? Because the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Right? We have no business being pessimistic. Right, Cornel West said when I was a, a young person, he said, nihilism is a bourgeois leisure. Right, we, don't have, we, don't, we don't have time for that. Right? We have to make ourselves hopeful. You, if, you, if you can't find a reason for hope, create one or be one. Right, because our young people don't have time for us to wait to figure it out, to try to find the reason for hope, to end the, the debates that are dividing us inside our field. They just need better pedagogy. They need better community in the school. They need to have their literacies honored. Right? They need the, the learning process to be more enjoyable. They need attachments. They need to be excited about learning, excited about school. Right? And I think that we can do that. I think we are doing that. We just need to speak with more of a unified voice and have the courage to take this into the classrooms. Right? Because that's the next frontier. Right? It's when that 8.30 to 2.30 struggle across the discipline. Thank you. Hope dealer, calling us yeah. a hope dealer. You are a hope dealer. Yeah. 
whole deal. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Ernest. This was inspiring, and um, you know, we're just going to jump into questions because we, we will mm -hmm. run out quickly. So we usually begin with our guests and in Wisconsin. How y'all doing? Do we have questions? Good. All right. So, anybody has questions? I, mean, I have one, but anybody else? I want to take the. I want to take the floor. Anybody? Um, I got an, an announcement and then a question. Uh, we we, you know, we really enjoyed the presentation. It was beautiful and inspiring. Um, I just want to let y'all know um, at, in in New York City that on Sunday night um, at eight o'clock. Uh, on the Soul Train Awards, the two of the students from First Wave are going to be announced um, is the MC Light UW Madison First Wave Scholars. Uh, they're going to be at 8 o'clock Eastern on BET, so you can all check that out uh, this Sunday night, November 25th. Uh, so let's give it up for Hip Hop Education on that part. Uh, and, and actually, you know, my question for you, uh, uh, Ernest, is the about now your leadership role at a national platform, you know, within, you know, particularly on this conference that you have coming up, uh, you know, that you really have a national platform to kind of talk about this issue of hip hop pedagogy, you know, at, at, at that kind of level with all of these teachers. And how are you looking to kind of develop the agenda? Uh, is it going to have a hip hop agenda? <laughs> um, how is it being the chair? And, and, and kind of with your perspective, knowing, you know, how mainstream for the most part, you know, English educators are. Um, having one, of, my mother being one of them, um, and just you know, just seeing this excitement. But the fact that you're in that position is extremely exciting. Uh, but then also knowing kind of also the fears and the doubts and the challenges yeah. and the fact that really hip hop studies and education is just at this very pioneering moment. You know, we might think it's more advanced, but when we start moving in the mainstream, we realize how little effect we've had yeah. on the you know on the broader world around yeah. us. So. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Well, I, I, um, and I'm open to suggestions, but there's three things I've, I've been thinking about doing um, right off the bat. One is uh, bringing students to the conference. right? And so not just having the teachers present, but students present. We're going to have students from Boston. Uh, hopefully we're going to be able to bring some students from New York, New Jersey um, to lead sessions right? Where, where, they're, where they're talking about this from their perspective. The second thing that I'm trying to do, work backwards from that convention, is um, working with teams of teachers who are doing this kind of work so that they can come and share their narratives with other teachers. I mean, there's one way to talk about it in the abstract, but um, to actually have um, teachers there talking about the, the, what they're learning in the class, some of the challenges, but some of the um, successes they're having is important. The third is, um, on the hip-hop agenda, you know, I want to be able to bring in teaching artists that are, that are key speakers at the convention, because we always have um, authors, right? But those authors are normally young adult lit authors or authors of literature, but to have some of the hip-hop practitioners in there as authors, I think would be pretty exciting sessions. So those are three things that we're gonna do. Um, it's in the call, I've been talking to people about it, but I'm really at this point trying to recruit, if you know of uh, student groups, if you know of a school that's doing this, if we can reach out, um, try to help fundraise, get people there to Boston, I feel like that's the best way to share it with the, uh, with the more mainstream teacher. Okay, just, just as a quick follow-up, um, you know, I, I just sent you an email that, so First Wave um, was uh, invited to open up the American Sociological Association National Conference in Denver okay. in August. And it was a huge hit. Um, so we're, we'll offer our services okay. uh, dead out to Boston. Very cool. Um, but also, you know, we have our summer institute that you know Michael Sorelli helps us yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, develop, and we have teachers from across the world that came through. So you know, we'd be more than happy to pass along names of teachers that are actually Im implementing the curriculum from that institute over the summer okay. that may be really interested in, in, in you know in joining your stuff. That'd be awesome. All right, do we have any questions here at Columbia? TC? Yes. Right. I'm wondering about, um, I'm wondering about code switching, uh -huh. um, and that we often think that it's the kids that have to come in and change how they speak, and that we kind of dehumanize the language of hip-hop. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's a way that we can implement for teachers to code switch their um, preconceived notions of the language of hip-hop, mm -hmm. and perhaps we can start to change the culture in that way as well in pre-service classes, and that is even something that's 
possible in the future of education? I definitely think um, in all the disciplines, right? If you're if you're talking about the power of language, um, the English classroom has to be um, a multilinguistic <laughs> space. And so the code switching could mean a couple of things, right? Um, for for teachers who have that linguistic dexterity, it's it's showing it, right? And, and, and I, I can think of people like Keith Gilliard, um, like uh, Geneva Smitherman, um, like Gloria Antaldua, right? Who are notorious for code switching during moments where the academic discourse is the modus operandi, right? Um, but not all teachers are going to have that linguistic dexterity. But what they can do is create spaces in their classroom for those who do to have that be the prominent mode of discourse in the classroom, right? Uh, and, and to create authentic ways for doing that. That's why I think that the part about hip hop is language study or rhetorical study shows that in many instances, it, 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 is, it is preferable to have like you know discourses of hip hop or, or African American uh, language or, or Spanish or other non English languages if you're if you're going to be rhetorically powerful right if I'm going to do something in my neighborhood uh, about eco apartheid uh, and in my neighborhood Upper Manhattan I better I better be multilinguistic in my approach right? so I definitely think that that's something that teachers can do and this whole idea are we teaching standard English and like we but you, what you're really teaching is the power of language. Right? And, and, and that, that means being fluent in the 21st century in multiple modes and in multiple languages. Great. Uh, Wisconsin, are we ready for another question? I'm curious to see what type of um, response have you gotten or, or do you anticipate from parents uh, as far as endorsing or, or protesting this being uh, mainstream in the classrooms? That's a good question. I think um, that's why I start with the educational context. I think you have to have a narrative to share. Um, you have to expect reasonable skeptics, uh, and, and that, that's a good thing. Um, what I think that it offers is, uh, you know, what I, what I would say to parents or to teachers is, uh, what are our key challenges, right? One is that students aren't engaged, right? And this is a way to begin to connect with students. Um, and, but what, mostly what I would do is share the work with them. Right? If you look at the kinds of things that are happening the, and, the, and the production the students are having, um, that, that that's what sells parents. Is this going to be rigorous? Is it, is, is, is it going to demand excellence from them? Uh, most of the things that are happening now, you know, I wish I could say that we were you know, supplanting rigorous literary curriculum in these English classrooms. Kids aren't doing anything in the classrooms. Right? So it's not like I'm taking Shakespeare out. They're, they're not even reading in the classroom. So, uh, you know, go to the parents, but, but I do think that you want to talk about integrating hip-hop into an English curriculum. There may be um, special topics courses. Uh, I always talk about the, the pedagogical approaches, the work that the students are going to be doing, uh, the skills that they're going to be developing. I, I, that's why I was saying we need to collect information. We need to be forthright with parents about why we're doing it. We need to address their concerns, and we need to speak back to them. That has to be, you know, a real conversation, but I think... You know, in, in my career, it's been collecting information. The parents see how hard the kids are working and what they're actually doing, whether it's putting on films or writing plays or writing a book of poetry, doing a research project, becoming historians, going to the community. And they say, okay, that, that feels like a real curriculum. But I, but I think you're right. You have to be upfront with those conversations. You have to expect um, some of the questions that people are going to offer based on what they think about education is going to mean. And you always have to be able to say every day in your curriculum, this is why I'm doing this, and this is how it's going to help your kid. But we also have to be um, open to the fact that if we can't say that, then maybe we have to change what we're doing, right? And hip hop education in English has to look a little bit different in the 8.30 to 2.30 than it would look in an after school program. You know, what's also interesting is that the, um, the parents are changing also, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have parents from the hip-hop generation who are more accepting and are saying, hey, why not? You know, we love hip-hop. Let's give it a chance. So I'm seeing more and more parents buying into it because they are from the hip-hop generation. And so, okay, TC, any question here? Look at this beautiful crowd. <laughs> I have a question. Let me say <laughs> um, so I was thinking about, I was struck by the idea of uh, graffiti on flyers and how that, it, the materiality from trains to buildings to, to now flyers, how that, how that has changed. 
the whole rhetorical space around where, how graffiti is being used. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously still being used in these other forms. Um, and I just, I guess, I'm just wondering about if we start talking about graffiti as, as part of designing and a part of uh, the, the economic side of hip hop. Um, I feel like we lose some of some of the rhetorical. Mm -hmm. um, its audiences and its purposes that it, that it originally had. Yeah. And I'm wondering about just any thoughts on that, about yeah. how to talk about the history of, of each of these forms. Yeah, I think that that's part of the um, contradictions and challenges of getting big, right? Um, and when I was thinking about the flyers, I was thinking more about, you know, for social movements um, and, and education, right? So you can bring that art form into a flyer um, project where you're educating people about the environment or being healthy or that sort of thing. But certainly it can also be um, the economic side. Uh, I, I feel like, um, you know, as an educator, you just make space for those conversations. Uh, I, I think it's good for students to think about using some of these skills to be able to create ways to make a living. You know, I have you know students from you know Oakland and Southern California who are making their living now because they design T-shirts and do that sort of thing. Um, but what what I guess we can try to do in, in, in the context of the class is is help them understand you know how all of these skills have potential, right? Um, to for transformative purposes, but also economic purposes, because learning standard English is the same thing, right? People are going to trans translate that into cash at some point in their life. Uh, so I don't mind to translate their artistic ability, uh, but but having a space, first of all, to make that a problem, right? That here, you know, have to have these talented artists are thinking, what what should I do with my art, right? That uh, and we're going to see a fusion between the word and the image in English class, right? I mean, it already is happening, right? It's going to continue to happen. So I think um, things like flyers or web design um, it is, a, is a place to begin to do that, to think about how words and images juxtaposed together become part of what we do in English. Yes. There's another question here. Right? Yes, and, and publishing is a huge business now in hip hop. And, um, and we have plenty of books that show how we can monetize you know, on the art form. Yeah. There's two parts to my okay. question. Um, my focus is on the dropout, the, the ones who drop out of school. Mm -hmm. um, how can we take hip hop education to the streets? Mm -hmm. How can we bring them into the classroom? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think that there's um, you know, a couple things that one of um, the students I'm working with, graduate students, we talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. right? And his work is on the prison to school pipeline. And, and um, thinking about what are um, ways to create programs, you know, to, to bring people back in the school. And so I, while I, I spend a lot of time focusing on the 8.30 to 2.30 and trying to prevent people from leaving, um, I think that there are a number of things that, uh, I think we need a social movement to convince um, state and federal governments to invest in out-of-school time programs. Right? We used to do that. And that's one place where we can come together across constituencies and say, hey, look, we have a $15 trillion economy. Right? We, need to, we need to put some of that to use for young people. Um, I think some of the most dangerous times for young people are between 3 and 6 in the evening on weekends and summers. And, and what, what kind of programs could we create there? Right? Uh, the other thing we know is many of the alternative high schools have the best pedagogy. Right? And so, so what about the alternative school spaces? Uh, to get people back in, uh, but but each of those, it's it's they're all pieces of a puzzle, right? I was focusing on in school, but I think some of these after school. Uh, I talked with the president of the New York Public Library, and they're all geared up to roll out this program. Think about if we use the New York Public Library system for these hip hop education. There's 1.1 million kids, just the school age kids. But if you have programs like 16 to 23 year olds, um, why don't we do things like that? I think the library is an untapped resource, right? And they have these spaces, right? So we could have programs there. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's figuring out, you know, how to use the spaces that exist, how to create the collaborations, like between something like the Hip Hop Education Center and the New York Public Library, but also um, lobbying city, state, federal entities for, for, to support that. Yeah, well, one, you mentioned the library. Um, you know, the MacArthur Foundation is funding libraries to build studios yeah. in the library. So after school, the kids can go and produce their albums, they can even do movies. So it's a very exciting time right now. 
Okay, Wisconsin. Okay, so we end up talking a lot about how hip hop pedagogy can be successful for students in terms of literacy and in terms of. Um, getting students interested in academics and all these things, and I feel like most of the time we're talking about um, students without disabilities, and so my or students without cognitive and physical disabilities specifically, because I think a great deal of this kind of talk also um, includes students with learning disabilities, specifically in areas of like science or English. And so my question is, how can hip hop pedagogy? or a hip hop curriculum be beneficial or even healing to students with cognitive and physical disabilities? Okay. What method of inclusion are we considering? Okay, that's a good question. I think, um, I mean, the schools where I'm working with are considering that. Uh, there's a range. Uh, one of the things that, I mean, you bring up a good question. We have to deal with two simultaneous realities. One is that our students are overdiagnosed. And, and mm -hmm. so, so a lot of them that are, um, that are, that, are, that are diagnosed as special needs are, are diagnosed for non-cognitive reasons. And so some of the things that teachers have been doing is trying to engage students um, who have been diagnosed mostly because they're bored in the school. Right? And so so we, the first thing we have to do is, is to figure out who really has needs um, that, that are cognitive and who just is, is, is tired of school. And, and a lot of the schools, that's a good number of the students who are being mainstreamed in the class. And because they're more engaged, um, because they have push-in models, and they have you know, um, smaller teacher-student ratios, many of those kids are highly functional. Um, I should look this way. Many of those students are trying to make eye contact with you and look away from the camera. Uh, many of those students are, are highly functioning in the classes. But some of the other things we know um, about healing, learning through music, right? learning through play, uh, having the opportunity to be tactile, um, oral language as a strategy for developing written language. I mean, these are things that I think are um, good for all students, but, but particularly for students um, with cognitive disabilities and with physical limitations. Uh, so I think you're right. Uh, we have a very difficult uh, proposition because we want to make sure that kids get what they need. We need to make sure that the kids are properly diagnosed. We have a, a, a crisis of overdiagnosis now. But we also have um, not effective strategies for differentiation for kids who really need the help. Yeah. Um, but in the schools where I've been working, we've been able to do that, thinking about how to modify the curriculum. But the, one of the things that we always do in the literacy classroom is allow more um, use of oral language as a way to, to, to um, develop comprehension, um, develop analysis, and, and so I think that a lot of these strategies um, are also effective because, because they use oral language, because um, they use more visual imagery, uh, and, 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 and the music, uh, which has, has been proven to be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Casey? Yes. Can you stand up so we can project? Um, hip hop has uh, manifested itself in the world and reached a, a sort of international audience. I was wondering, uh, and in local context, I was wondering, have you seen any successful hip hop pedagogy in a foreign language class, say hip hop in a Chinese class or a Spanish class, and so on? Yeah, well, um, in, in East LA, I mean, they were connecting the Koreos to hip hop. Um, and so it was using Spanish language uh, in, a, in, a, in a school um, that, that had a, a large Latino population, but that was more in uh, Mexican-American studies classes. Uh, but it, that would be very interesting, right, to think about the multilingualism of hip-hop. Um, I have seen um, many foreign language classes use popular culture to teach foreign languages. Right? Because the kids are, it's the same thing, right? You read boring old novels in the other language and that, <laughs> bores you to tears, right? So why not think about popular cultural production? Uh, but, but I think that's the beauty of this, right? To think about the interdisciplinary nature of it or what it looks like in other um, disciplines. And we just need to keep sharing those examples. Because you know, we have um, less and less kids are wanting to take foreign language. And, and I think it's because 
of the same issue, it's just not engaging, you're not saying why there's a need to do that, but, but to think about using popular culture as a way to teach foreign languages, I think would be really good topic. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Do we have another question in Wisconsin? Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, it seems like uh, there's a big emphasis in Wisconsin about the common core standards coming up and the change, and I guess that's the national as well. And um, I guess I wondered like, how you talk about um, hip hop pedagogy with in light of that, because it seems like part of what the Common Core is going to do is ask um, uh, teachers to bring in sort of more traditional texts yeah. in a way. I mean, we're almost going the other way. Yeah. Um, and so, and then also to bring in more texts that aren't literature based. And yeah. so, I guess I just wondered how you thought about talking about hip hop pedagogy given those political pressures. That's a good question. What we did with one of the districts I worked in New Jersey in August, we went through standard by standard. Um, as, a, as a, a, a department. And we really found, I mean, you're right, there's a couple um, that throw in, you know, like at least one example from the 18th, 19th century literature, right? I mean, there's a couple of those in the informational and the reading, but most of them were, we thought, um, opening up more space for different kinds of text. Um, and it was much more um, what it meant to, to read deeply, to interpret details. Uh, and, and I felt the teachers, after reading that, felt like they had more space. Um, Certainly, you're talking about multimodal units that would include some bits of canonical literature and some pieces from hip hop or other popular culture um, as being a hybrid. But um, we felt like uh, if we could do these things around deep analysis, uh, interpretation, the genres students would be writing in. So, for instance, uh, you know, say they were doing the hip hop cultural production. That could be the the long term. Was it the long term sustained research project? And, and that could be something that's written in academic discourse, but it could be about hip hop or, or things in the community. And, and actually, one of the seventh grade teachers in one of the schools that, that really turned it around, that's what they did. You know, for their research project, they were looking at activists and they were looking at, you know, social movements in their neighborhood. Um, uh, another school in New Jersey had the kids doing the same thing. And so they were, the subject matter was different, but they were still uh, in, in, engaging the, um, the, the genres from the common core. Uh, and I think when, when, we, when you think about the hip hop pedagogy, I mean, there are other informational texts too um, that, that could be consulted, the magazine articles and the media pieces. And, and so that, that's all um, you know, useful too. But what we try to do as an initial step, because very few of the schools where I'm working are willing to you know, have a hip hop 101 class, but how can you have a theme-based unit that is anchored in some canonical text, but, but it's a larger theme that allows you to draw in these popular cultural texts and weave them together. And can you have a, a, a long-range sustainable project that's actually much more relevant? And, and we've been able to do that you know, with texts even as uh, classical as Moby Dick. I mean, so a teacher taught Moby Dick last year to sophomores in Orange, New Jersey, and they had hip hop and every kind of popular culture that you could imagine in there. And looking at these themes, right, you know, uh, you could imagine all the themes and the connections they were making as they were going through Moby Dick and, and thinking about hip hop and youth culture. You know, um, I have a question here. And here. Um, I guess my question, you know, we get a lot of pushback around the texting, right? It's are losing their language, they don't know how to speak, they, they can only speak in 60 characters, right? What do you think about that, using technology like texting and hip hop in the classroom? Are we, you know, dumbing down our students or are we actually engaging? It's a great question, Martha. It's funny, I have a commentary coming out, it's going to give me a lot of trouble because I say um, most schools banish the most powerful computers in the, on the campus. Right. I mean, that Samsung Galaxy 3 is the most powerful computer you probably have in the room, and it's shut <laughs> off in someone's pocket because they can't use it. Uh, you know, I think we survived um, the removal of Latin and Greek from our curriculum pretty well. Right? But, you know, in 1880, they would have said, what do you mean you're not going to teach Ovid? Right? Or, you know, they're not going to translate Homer from the Greek. They're not going to be smart anymore. And that's what I mean by reinventing. We, you have to take a long view of this, a historical view. Uh, 
you look at what the university presidents were saying in 1890, oh my god, we're going to teach English literature now, right, and not the Greek and the Latin. Then you went from teaching Shakespeare to teaching, you know, God forbid, Virginia Woolf. <laughs> right? And then, you know, so it, each new technology or new moment seems scary or different. Um, turn on the phones. For goodness sake, they're not even phones. They're mobile media devices. They're very powerful computers. And since you can't get online anyway at the school, the best way to access the internet, you know, I've seen a teacher say, can someone look that up on their phone? Because this computer is like, we're never going to get the kids to like, 1875, you know? <laughs> already done it under the table anyway. I'm not so convinced about that. What we know about language is actually the opposite. The more languages you know, the better meta understanding you have of language. Right? You don't lose language. It's not, that's not how it works. The language proliferates language. Uh, so that, that is... Um, but I, but I think that's on the way out. But, uh, but a colleague of mine and I are actually writing a op-ed about you know, banishing the most powerful computers on campus and the common sense of that means, which is not very common sense. Okay, I think we have room for two more questions. Wisconsin, do you have a question? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. So first of all, thank you for, for your wonderful beginning. And this is just my usual question, and I apologize for it. How does a classroom that is not anti-child, that is not an industrialized model of producing obedient workers look? How do we allow children who are active beings to, to move and speak and not be the victims and subjects of top-down authority, no matter what you teach? You know, I, I see subjects change and subject matter change, but I don't see the way children are treated or what they're allowed to do. Use the bathroom when they need it. Drink when they're thirsty. Speak out, you know, not be, not be taught to walk in straight lines and raise their hands and, and be on task and stop when the bell rings and all that kind of stuff. That's a, that's a great question. I think uh, some of the things that I've been seeing... Um, you know, when we, you talk about 21st century learning, a lot of times people think you're talking about technology, but um, many times it's about an interactivity. So uh, at, at one school, uh, the teacher's essential question was, how do we foster a different kind of talk in the classroom? And so the teachers are asking that kind of question. We um, focus in on four kinds of talk. One is small group. How to help kids to be able to talk to each other in a small group to work on a long-term project. Um, a second was... Um, how do they speak in an open class discussion? Right? How can they build on each other's comments and listen to each other and do that sort of thing? Um, the third kind of talk was um, how they make formal presentations. And the fourth kind of talk was how they talk in structured online communities. And so the teachers have really turned these classrooms around where the, the chairs are facing each other and you see small circles and large circles and they're in Socratic sometimes and they have an inner circle and an outer circle. And, uh, they're struggling through it because the students aren't used to, to talking in that way. But that's a step. Some of the other things, I think, um, are, are bigger structural issues. And I can think of some schools that are uh, moving toward you know, uh, you know, not having bells, for instance, in a school that has music during the passing yes. periods and there's not bells. And um, you know, I think they still struggle with the freedom of movement for kids to go to the bathroom and that sort of thing. And they need to, um, you know, be able to have more open space at the same time, you know, maintain some order in the school. But I've been very pleased that uh, there's been much more focus I can see on interactivity in the classroom. And even though people are very uncomfortable with it, both the teachers and the students, the idea that the aesthetic of what the class looks like has to be different. So we do things like measuring the amount of time student talk versus teacher talk, uh, keeping track of how many students get to speak during the class period, and, uh, Mostly in all the 90-minute classes, every student will speak in every class. Students will have a chance to write in every class, will have a chance to read in every class. Um, at least once or twice during the marking period, a student will make a formal presentation to her peers. Uh, and, and so they're, they're making those moves. I, I think um, it's hard because our, our schooling was instantiated in that industrial logic, and so many, many of us feel that's the only way schools are supposed to look. But... Um, but I, I'm on the optimistic side that, that I, I see it getting better, although, I mean, your point is very well taken. We have a long way to go. Okay, and the final question here, anyone? Yeah, I all right. 
Um, I'm just wondering what advice you might offer to someone who feels like they don't have much of a background or connection to hip hop and how they could access it. And what role you see for hip hop pedagogy in schools that also don't feel like it's central to their culture or that it is for some students but not all students? Mm -hmm. I'll take the second question first. Um, And I, I think that you know we teach students about rhetoric, and one of the reasons we do that is because it is often very difficult to convince people of what you would want to convince them of, and the strategies you use can determine your effectiveness. Right? There are some people who can be convinced easily, and some people who won't be convinced ever. But for most of the ones in the middle, there are different things you can do to convince them. I always begin with what are legitimate concerns that this person has. And two, what is it that they need to hear from me that I am willing to say? And I've been in some pretty, you know, conservative places. I mean, I won't name any names, but uh, I say, so how's that engagement going with your kids? Right? They just fired up about what's going on. Let's go look at some classics. No, not so much, right? So that's a concern they have. You know, are you interested in finding ways to engage the students? I don't jump in with, you know, uh, I brought some turntables, right, and rolling them into the classroom, but, but we, can, we can deal with the issue. You're not happy with the student engagement. Oh. Did I think so? TC cut it off, cut us off. Oh, it's the name of McCurdy? It's cut us off. Well, we, yeah. Wow. Just cut us off. Wow. It just stopped like that? 901, 901. It's just, it's just, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak more quickly. Um, so with the, um, the move to school, I would start with the questions of what the challenges are that we face. Uh, and most of the time, that gets us to an honest discussion about a lack of agency on the student part, a lack of relevancy, and a lack of engagement. The other thing that's really important early on, getting allies either in your school or across schools, and, and, and collecting information. I, I, I say it in an innocuous way, you know, like, well, what information will we need to collect to know if we're getting to where we want to go? So all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you have evidence that, look, the kids are more engaged. This is the work that they're doing. Um, I've seen that move in districts and in places where <laughs> people, uh, people thought that was not possible. But I definitely would. Oh, we're going to be there. <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> uh, but got I, it? All right, we're all ready. Uh, this, he's finishing up. I, 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 can, I can say goodbye to all the Wisconsin folks and thank you. Right, well, thank you very thank much. You. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Yay. Bye, Wisconsin. Uh, but uh, finding people to ally with, uh, what, what is your discipline, Becca? English. English. Okay, so then, you know, uh, we have teams of folks across the country that are doing that. I think how you define your cohort can be different. Um, so the core is not just the teachers at my school, but folks around, folks in this room. I, I, I'm looking at folks in this room who I know do amazing things and asking them. Um, but starting conservatively, right, figuring out how to integrate it in ways that um, are kind of consistent with the discipline, making the disciplinary arguments is really important. Um, like I. I Obviously, people call, they call me, they know what it is that I, that I have to do, but even people who, who wanted to be against it had a hard time arguing with all the evidence we know about why kids are not motivated, that all the things we know about language and literacy being plural, um, about classes needing to be more interactive, um, and about English changing. Right? The world of 2050 is not going to be like the world of 1950. So, so doing those kinds of things, um, I think, creates more space, um, it, it helps to move the schools, but uh, most everyone has some legitimate concern uh, and, and some legitimate needs that you can have fulfilled with um, you know, moving towards something that could be like a hip hop pedagogy. Uh, and getting research, a lot of schools, you know, people ask me, I will name some of the places that have positive, like Virginia and Kentucky, where you know, at the end the superintendent is saying, when can you come back? Rural Indiana, 
right? And they've got hip hop going on in the classroom. It's because we brought research and brought evidence and brought data, talked to them about issues that, that they agreed upon they had, and, and, and showing what it looked like in the classroom. Right. It's 9 o'clock. All right. <laughs>